Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is new, then. You all had a preem 4th of July celebrating your independence from the slaphead curse, which anybody can do regardless of which country they hail from. First of all, sorry the cadence of my uploads have been kind of slow. It's just one of those weeks, you know how it is. But don't worry, I fully intend to go over everything I said I would go over, but before I do that, I've got a bit of breaking news to go over with y'all today. You see, a few days ago, this press release appeared in my inbox. Apparently, a team led by the University of California has discovered a new potential hair loss cure, you heard that right, cure, called SQ3, which not only causes hair growth, but can even potentially create brand new hair follicles on a shiny bald scalp. That's right, this treatment has the potential even to grow hair in a slick bald scalp, which means we may finally have a pharmaceutical alternative to things like hair transplants, hair systems, as well as that ugly ass beanie bald cells like Tim Pool like to wear. Of course, when I first first heard about this, I felt similarly to how Jason Blaha must feel whenever a woman gives him a compliment. It just sounds too good to be true. So of course, I was very skeptical at first. We hair loss sufferers have been burned many, many times after all. So let's take a scalpel to this and go balls deep into this research as we always do and see if it's as good as the headlines make it out to be. Well, the first thing to note here is that in this case, the actual researchers behind S Cube 3 seem downright enthusiastic about it. In this press release, here is what they had to say, quote, we revealed that the S cube 3 signaling molecule, which dermal papilla cells produce naturally, is the messenger used to tell the neighborhood hair stem cells to start dividing, which heralds the onset of new hair growth, unquote. And here's another quote, quote, these experiments provide proof of principle data that S cube 3 or derived molecules can be a promising therapeutic for hair loss, unquote. So this all sounds very exciting, but unfortunately the article backing up all this research is behind a paywall and it is not even available on Sci-Hub. But that's okay, because I'm here for you, my tunes, and I don't mind shelling out a few bucks to keep you all up to date on the latest hair loss research. So here's the article. It's titled, quote, Hedgehog signaling reprograms hair follicle niche fibroblast to a hyperactivated state, unquote. So, if you've been following my channel for a while, you know I've talked about a signaling pathway called the WNT WINT pathway. The WINT pathway is involved in triggering and prolonging the antigen growth phase in the hair follicles, and it turns out the WINT pathway is inhibited by the trash hormone DHT in people who are genetically susceptible to androgenic alopecia. So there has been some research on using drugs to stimulate the WINT pathway, and one promising drug is called Way 316 606, which I talked about in one of my videos that I'll link below. But the point here is that the hair cycle is regulated by not just the wind pathway, but probably by dozens of signaling pathways. These pathways trigger off the different phases of the hair loss cycle from the antigen growth phase all the way to the catagen phase that converts the hair follicle into a resting state. After the telogen phase, the hair sheds and the antigen phase begins again. In androgenic alopecia, DHT interferes with the signaling pathways so that the antigen phase shortens and with each hair cycle the hair grows back more and more miniaturized. Eventually the hair follicles die off and you're left with a slick ugly bald scalp. So the hedgehog pathway is actually known officially as the sonic hedgehog pathway. So I don't know why researchers would name it after a spiky blue video game character, but it does show that researchers at least have a sense of humor. But anyways, the hedgehog pathway is another one of these signaling pathways like the wind pathway, and it has been theorized to be important for hair growth. So... The study on this S cube 3 stuff is a very detailed and complex basic research study that uses a lot of sophisticated gene techniques, but fortunately, the overall results of the study are not too hard to understand. So let's break it down. So what these researchers did first was to create a mutant mouse where the mutation caused the hedgehog pathway to have a specific part of the pathway called the smoothened or SMO protein to never be turned off. So the hedgehog pathway is always active within these mutant mice the researchers created. Now, this would not be a good mutation to have in real life because activation of the hedgehog pathway has been associated with the proliferation of cancer cells. But these researchers just wanted to know what effect having a hyperactive hedgehog pathway would have on hair growth in these mutated mice. Before I continue, it's important to realize though that in mice, the hair cycle is completely synchronized while in humans, it is random, which is why in the scalp of a human head without androgenic alopecia, some hair 
others are in the telogen resting phase and most are within the antigen growth phase. In the case of mice though, when they have a shed, they lose all of their hair at once because all of the hairs are in the same phase at the same time. Also, mouse hair changes color depending on what phase this is in, so overall it is very easy to study the hair cycle of mice and that's one reason mice are often used in a lot of hair loss research. Anyways, when the control mice had all their hair in the telogen resting phase, the mutant mice with the hyperactive sonic hedgehog pathway already had new tufts of hair in the antigen growth phase as seen in this image. So the mutants lost the coordinated hair cycle seen normally in mice. Instead, the antigen growth cycle started up prematurely in these mutants. Even more remarkable though, was that in the mutant mice, brand new hair follicles were created as seen in this figure here. The reason this is amazing is that normally in adult mice as well as in adult humans, no new hair follicles are ever created after we are born. We are stuck with the hair follicles that were created when our skin was formed in the uterus. The only exception to this is that occasionally in large wounds, there can be new hair follicles created. The process that creates wound, wound healing can sometimes generate new hair follicles from stem cells, but this is rare and more often than not, just wounding on the scalp will result in scar tissue and therefore generally we are just stuck with the number of hair follicles we are born with. But activation of the hedgehog pathway in these mutant mice actually created new hair follicles, so that really sounds great. But like I said earlier, it's not practical to mutate our own hedgehog pathway since it can promote the proliferation of cancer cells. So the investigators started looking for some downstream effects of the hedgehog pathway that might allow some kind of treatment that would affect just hair follicles and not involve activating the hedgehog pathway throughout the body, thus limiting any potential harm it may cause. So to do this, first the investigators took a more detailed look at what was happening in the hair follicles in these mutant mice. They found that activation of the hedgehog pathway activated at least 27 other signaling pathways in the dermal papilla cells, which are the main cells in the hair follicle that control hair growth. These pathways included the Wnt pathway, as well as pathways affecting hair growth factors, such as TGF-beta, IGF, and VEGF, as well as many more. These pathways were activated with the investigators call dermal papilla-like cells or DPL cells, and these are essentially cells like stem cells that can convert themselves into new dermal papilla cells. These new dermal papilla cells get into what the investigators call a hyperactive state, thus not only do these cells more rapidly enter into the antigen growth phase, but they can actually create new hair follicles like I already mentioned. So, this is overall very exciting, but how do we convert this theory to a real hair loss treatment? Well, when the investigators looked at all the signaling factors upregulated in these mutant mice, the top upregulated factor in the DPL cells was something called S cube 3. S cube 3 is a protein that is found in the dermal papilla and dermal sheath of developing hair follicles in utero. In utero, I should say. The investigators found that S cube 3 was found in antigen dermal papilla cells, but but not intelligent cells. In fact, S cube 3 seems to trigger antigen growth and it decreases just before antigen termination. So the investigators proposed that S cube 3 was the signaling factor triggered off by the hedgehog pathway that actually controlled the hair growth cycle. That would make S cube 3 the master switch for the hair growth cycle in its entirety. The investigators hypothesized that S cube 3 stimulates the TGF beta pathway and that this is what triggers antigen Antigen. Well, if you followed the research on my channel before, this might seem a little confusing because TGF-beta is usually thought to be a negative growth factor for hair that triggers the catagen phase that converts hairs from the antigen growth phase into the telogen resting phase. So why would triggering TGF-beta pathway be a growth stimulant? Well, after a lot of research, I found this article by Kirsten Foitzek, I should say. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But anyways, this Kirsten Foitzek published a lot of research on TGF-beta as well as hair loss. First of all, it's important to realize that there are actually three different TGF beta isoforms, and that includes beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. Dr. Foitzek notes that all three of these TGF beta isoforms inhibit hair growth in vitro, meaning when looking at cultured skin cells within a petri dish. However, the different TGF beta isoforms behave differently in vivo, meaning intact organisms. When looking at TGF beta 1 in vivo, it does indeed also inhibit hair growth as 
expected from the in vitro experiments. However, when looking at TGF beta 2 in vivo, TGF beta 2 actually stimulates hair follicle formation. Dr. Foitzik explains this discrepancy by hypothesizing that TGF beta 2, quote, induces other growth factors possibly produced by cells other than keratinocytes, which are not present in the in vitro cultures, and that these other growth factors are responsible for keratinocyte growth stimulation and hair follicle induction, unquote. So whether S cube 3 works through the TGF beta pathway or some other pathway, the question remains, does it actually work? Well, the investigators grafted human scalp hair to the back of mice and then injected the mice with SQ3. Here is what they found. Quote, Compared with control, SQ3 accelerated antigen entry of grafted human hair follicles and stimulated new antigen by mouse host hair follicles. We conclude that SQ3 is a mesenchymal niche-derived hair growth activator in mice whose expression, pathway, and function are at least partially conserved in human scalp. Unquote. You can see the resultant growth here. So S cube 3 looks very promising, and the next step would be to inject it into intact humans. So since it treats hair loss using cellular signaling mechanisms, it might be effective not just as a non-specific hair growth stimulant like minoxidil, but it might also reverse some of the effects of DHT in androgenic alopecia, since DHT inhibits signaling pathways like the Wnt pathway and the hedgehog pathway, so maybe S cube 3 would work by reversing these evil downstream effects of the trash hormone DHT. DHT. So this is pretty exciting news as the hair loss community is in desperate need for a new hair growth stimulant. As much as I like the recommended treatments like minoxidil, we know it doesn't work for everybody and even for those people for whom it does work, it would be nice if we had something that was just a little bit stronger. It's funny how these hair loss forums and subreddits will have on average like 10 or more threads per day talking about nonsense like scalp tension, blood flu, and broccoli, but almost nobody ever talks about legitimate hair loss treatments on the horizon and such as this. But hopefully, now this video has brought some interest to the subject, and we'll see more new research on the subject in the coming months. I would hate to see S cubed 3 go the same way as, say, topical psychosporin, which I covered in my last video, since that wasn't even given its proper chance to shine, despite the promising research done on it. I'm pretty optimistic about this, though, because the scientific community knows a hell of a lot more about hair loss research today than they did back in the late 80s and 90s, and I'm pretty confident S cubed 3 will not be unfairly overlooked the way topical cycle sporing was, so I'd say keep an eye on this one, Shun, because I'm feeling pretty good about this. But anyways, I'm out. I'll be back with more content real soon because I know that we've got a lot of work to do and I'm pretty backlogged, so I'll see you next time. God bless.